following interview was conducted with Professor Henry Z. Sheely, Associate Professor of Communication for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April 27, 2011, in his office in Baring Hall. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. And good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Sheely. Let's we'll start off. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years, in high school and grade school. All right. I was uh, born in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And uh, my parents were uh, Henry Sheely the third, which makes me Henry Sheely the fourth. I never use the fourth; it's the Z. The Z stands for Zagel, which is uh, my mother's maiden name. She was Marzell Zagel Sheely when she married my uh, father, and uh, I was uh, born. Uh, in about 1933, August 27, 1933, in Sheboygan, okay. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. What was um, early years, your grade school? Okay, I, I went to uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, High School. Abraham Lincoln was always uh, kind of regarded as the greatest president we ever knew when we were uh, younger. And uh, I guess he's emerged through history as... Yeah. Uh, still being maybe number one but um, I uh, uh, did not have what I'd call a great start I um, you know I never thought I'd be a college professor but anyhow uh, I flunked kindergarten uh, I couldn't handle the uh, the rest period they had uh, us lie down on mats for a period of time and I wouldn't stay still on those mats and they thought there was something wrong with me that uh, I wouldn't um, stay stationary and I wouldn't necessarily obey the uh, teacher you know, like I should I, I was uh, I had fine parents and I had no family problems at home but I uh, also I think got um, chicken pox or something and uh, missed, missed some school so they held me back a year and I tell my students sometimes that, that um, you know, not all of us start off with brilliant careers. <laughs> and flunking kindergarten really was my, the start of my career. Now, grade school was um, fun. I really knew the, um, the boys especially. The girls frightened me a little bit. The boys uh, were great. We played a lot of ball together. We uh, played after school. We became uh, friends for for life. And um, uh, I did really enjoy uh, my elementary school uh, period. We went from uh, first grade through um, uh, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was trying to think of some of the teachers that I had in, in the back, uh, background, and, and they, they were all good and, 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 and nice, but I uh, uh, took a while to what we might call adjust. And uh, I turned out all, all right, I guess, but uh, I did get in a fight or two. And um, uh, one time I playing uh, soccer with one of the boys and I um, had to slug him and uh, I, I hit him in the head and I broke my thumb so I had to go home and uh, get my thumb fixed up and my uncle was the doctor uh, my mother's um, brother was a doctor and then she had had a sister they were both um, oh about 20 years older than she was uh, Marsdale was regarded as the uh, mistake in the family it came 20 years uh, later than expected actually she was never expected but she turned into a wonderful uh, mother I was blessed with a mother the uncle told me how to grip my fist. I had my thumb underneath my fingers, 
and that contributed to breaking the thumb. So he said, if you ever get in a fight again, you put your thumb behind your fingers. But I've never had a fight since. That was the first and last uh, fight that I ever had. But uh, while we're talking about my mother, um, she was really an outstanding lady. Uh, she um, was a social worker in uh, Chicago. She actually lived in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and, and um, that's where she met uh, my father, of mm -hmm. course. But uh, she worked for a while in uh, downtown uh, Chicago in the, um, well, I'll call it some of the uh, rougher areas of the community, and worked with uh, uh, less fortunate people than uh, what we were back in uh, Sheboygan. And she was a kind gal, and she set up what was called the Kitties Camp in Sheboygan. And it was a young camp at the edge of town that children who didn't have uh, parents uh, could go to, or children from relatively poor families mm -hmm. could gather. And, and she ran that uh, plant, and then eventually met my uh, my father. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, my um, father's father was age 50 when he um, got married. And that's my grandfather, and I never got to know my uh, grandfather because he uh, passed away before I was born, but he was known as the dynamo among the Sheelys, and he built up uh, a, a very successful uh, business in Sheboygan. He um, acquired a lot of stock in uh, hotels in um, Chicago. And um, he had a couple of vessels that sailed the Great Lakes. They were cargo vessels, two and three uh, mast schooners that carried um, Christmas trees from the Sheboygan and Green Bay area down to Chicago, and they sold those down to Chicago. They had uh, china and goods that they transported across the Great Lakes. And uh, both ships um, sunk, and he lost them entirely. He didn't believe in insurance. So he lost his ships, and in the Depression, he lost virtually almost all of his... Uh, uh, business. I, I suspect, uh, suspect that he lost virtually, well, it, it is known in the family that he lost over a million dollars, and a million dollars at that time was a million dollars, and a lot of money. But uh, he uh, eventually, uh, well, he, he built um, in, in Sheboygan the Civil War Memorial which is very similar to the Battleground Memorial out in Battleground that mm -hmm. celebrates the Battle of Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And um, this uh, uh, is still standing. I remember seeing pictures. I never met my grandfather, but I seen pictures of his uh, horses that he had, like uh, like Augie Bush has these uh, big Clydesdales that carried the beer all around St. Louis. Well, he, he, uh, my grandfather carried the, uh, uh, the marble and the granite that went into a lot of the banks and the buildings that were built in Sheboygan. And he had a gravel pit in the, uh, on the west side of the town. And uh, he made the gravel and then bought the cement, Medusa cement from Manitowoc. And, uh, this uh, uh, contributed to building most of the sidewalks and streets in Sheboygan. And I still have one or two of the bronze labels that says, laid by Henry Sheely. And uh, that term, uh, laid, it, uh, became embarrassing uh, to me in school. The kids teased me a little bit because words have different meanings and can be interpreted in different ways. But anyhow, uh, the, uh, uh, the, there are several remarks of w where he made things for the town. 
including the Hope statue. The Hope statue came from Italy, and he placed that way on the top of his monument store where he had other uh, goods, like we sold cement, bag, bag cement. And um, uh, we dealt with uh, fire brick and uh, cyclone fences for a while. He was in a number of business uh, activities. So he was quite a, quite a successful businessman, but really lost almost all of it in the Great Depression. So my father uh, uh, went off to uh, college and, and was, uh, uh, oh, he only lasted one year because um, uh, he had to go back and run what was left of the business. And uh, I would spend most of my childhood with my two brothers, uh, Bob and Bert. And we would uh, help my father uh, run the business. It became relatively a family business, just with the um, three of us. We'd have uh, a helper every once in a while. But uh, I learned a lot about um, digging uh, foundations and cemeteries to mount monuments. I learned a lot about sandblasting uh, uh, markers and monuments to carve the letters into the marble and granite, like this sign on my desk here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a lot of experience emptying out boxcars um, with fire brick and storing these. These, these fire bricks were special uh, bricks that went into uh, blast furnaces. Yeah and they could stand the heat uh, of the blast furnaces that made some of the factories in Sheboygan uh, function and, and go. Sheboygan was known for its chairs and its children and its churches, and that was uh, an important thing. I uh, did um, have a job. Uh, there was a gasoline station, Standard Oil station, across the street. And my first, one of my first jobs, I think, was uh, uh, pumping gas. And in those days, uh, when let's see, I'm 77 now. In those days, we uh, uh, checked the oil in every car that came in. We, there was, we serviced every car, and we checked the tires on every car. And then poured in the uh, in the gas, and that was a nice educational experience for me. And I learned the value of the dollar. I got uh, I think it was 15 cents uh, uh, an hour as my pay. But you could see movies in Sheboygan, even double headers. I, I call them double headers. I, uh, but you'd see two movies for a dime. And the movies were very expensive in those days. But that was kind of my uh, background. I, I don't look at being an outstanding uh, uh, student in elementary school, although the guy I did hit in the head uh, was the smartest guy in class. And uh, I think I resented the fact that I wasn't the smartest guy in class. And I, I might have been uh, as high as second, but I, I, I don't know. We didn't tally those uh, right. things at that time. Well, just a little bit about high school. Did you, is that in the same town that you went to high school? Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, I had, uh, I would call it the, the best high school career that, that, that any man could have. I remember this very day, the president of the high school coming to Abraham Lincoln School in about uh, when I was in about eighth grade. And he described what high school was going to be like. And, you know, all the elementary schools were going to go and we'll go to high school. And uh, uh, they said they had a football team and they had a basketball team, baseball team. And I was interested in, in those uh, sports. And I was impressed with this guy who was the president of the high school. By the time he got done with his talk, I said, I'd like to go to that Sheboygan Central High School, and I'd like to be the president of that high school someday. Well, I, uh, I was really more interested in, in the sports, and I 
played a, a lot of football, and um, we played what was called uh, tag football. You, you put a red handkerchief in your back, and you pull that out. You didn't tackle the players. But I remember one game where we played against St. Cyril and we beat them 86 to nothing. And I was the quarterback on that team and I threw for four touchdown passes and ran for four. I counted for eight touchdowns and I thought I was the greatest quarterback in the country. But uh, I went to high school. Uh, actually, I was a pretty good basketball player too. Uh, I, I think uh, there's... A guy named Wally Recolitis who was, came to our high school later, and uh, he and I had fought it out for the scoring championship in uh, elementary school. We played a lot of basketball games in the YMCA, and I don't know whether Wally ended up being the leading scorer in the city, or I did, but uh, we, we were close. And um, um, there was, um, oh, uh, a uh, couple other things before I get, I get to high school here where um, I really l like to play catch. My dad, who taught me a lot of things about uh, the value of the dollar and uh, how to dig a ditch and how to set a monument and how to uh, uh, throw a bag of cement from a railroad car and I was truck and then take it out to the cemetery and mix the cement in the mixer and lay the uh, foundation for a stone. Uh, we uh, played catch a lot and uh, I uh, got to tell you a little bit about my two brothers. The um, brother um, Bob who ended up uh, getting several Fulbright scholarships and going to uh, and became a great high school teacher outside of Milwaukee in Hartland High School, one of the better high schools in the state. Uh, he um, was about five years younger than I was, and he grew up. Uh, um, well, I c kind of uh, resented all the attention that shifted from me to him when he was uh, uh, born, and uh, uh, I, I didn't really fully appreciate his presence. But uh, there uh, was a time when we were still in elementary school when the police came up to our high school, uh, I mean to our elementary school, Abraham Lincoln Elementary School. And the police had, had a little baby, a little three, four-year-old guy in the uh, in the police car, and he says, "Any any of you kids in this uh, Abraham Lincoln school here know this guy?" And I said, "Sure, I do. That's Buttercup. Uh, Buttercup is what we called my brother, and uh, he was uh, essentially picked up by the police for eating grapes at Charlie's Market." They had the grapes laid down on the table, and he ran away from home one time and went down and stuffed himself with all the grapes. But I had to tell the police where he lived. I says, he lives in my house. And they took him back home, and uh, he, he, he did all right. There was one other incident that we had. Is, um, I, I cha changed uh, my attitude towards him a little bit. Uh, I knew he wouldn't grow up as a thief, stealing grapes, but I thought that um, uh, here was a, a situation um, where, um, let's see, I'm, I'm recall it. yeah, it was when he got a bicycle, and I had my tricycle, and he had a tricycle, you know. Yeah. And he would uh, ride down the block with me. I told my mother he was finally worth having around. He was about four or five then. And I said, now that he can ride a bike, he's worth being here. And then I developed an appreciation for him. And there was one other thing that we did one time. Is I became a, a pretty good pitcher before I got to high school. 
and I played in a lot of American Legion baseball. And uh, I probably was better a better pitcher than I was a quarterback or a basketball player. And uh, one time we had a game at Kiwanis Park where um, only eight of my team showed up. I'm one of the eight. We needed nine men or we would forfeit the game. Well, my brother never really uh, was that interested in uh, sports, and he was five years younger than the, than the other guys. And I said, uh, Bob, you got to help us out. You got to play in the outfield. I'm going to put you in right field. You you play. He said, I don't know how to catch a ball. I said, Don't don't worry. I said, Just step to the side and let the ball roll as far as it does, and then you chase after it and throw it back into the infield. But you don't have to catch any of the balls. So, but I said, we need you to fill out that nine-man team or we're going to forfeit the game. So he said, well, make sure they don't hit any balls in my way. So I said, okay, I'll work on it. So I had one of the best uh, strikeout days of my career. I struck out 17 batters. And, the, uh, and we won the game thanks to his presence uh, being there. Uh, the 17 strikeouts, I think, helped, too. But anyhow, we uh, really had fun, and I appreciated uh, his uh, presence. Okay, so uh, we want to you know, get to high school, and I'm like, yeah. we, we yeah. get there, and uh, <clears throat> um, I go out for the football team. I, I, I think I'm the um, Drew Brees of the uh, town, you know, and uh, I... Uh, really um, uh, lasted two weeks in football. Got, got a wrecked neck, uh, broken ankle, all kinds of things. And uh, my mother talked me into the fact that football wasn't for me. She said I should go talk to Mr. Melzer and talk about getting on the uh, debate team. I said, what's that? He said, Mr. Melzer will explain what the debate team is. So I, I did that, and uh, I learned quickly what uh, debating was like. I kind of enjoyed it. And, um, but I was on the basketball team uh, later in the, um, in the freshman year, and I was captain of the basketball team. <laughs> And I played basketball pretty good, and then the, the sophomore year, and I, I, each semester in high school, I would be on the uh, student senate. I did like the, the government, and the, and the homeroom would re uh, select the guys to represent us in the senate, and I'd be in the senate each semester. And um, uh, I got on a couple of committees, and one of them was on the Christmas tree decoration committee. <laughs> and uh, the, so the sophomore year, uh, I, I had made the starting lineup in the basketball team, but I had to direct the committee and make sure that Christmas tree got up there in time. And uh, I felt that as chairman of the Christmas tree committee that I was a pretty important person, and I better get that job done. Well, I reported to a basketball practice 15 minutes late and cut. And I wasn't totally cut off the team, but they reduced me from the first team to the third team, and I had to fight my way back onto that basketball team. And there were practice sessions where I knew that I deserved the right to get back to my first team position. But the coach never let me get back. And uh, I uh, was not invited out the junior year to play basketball. So I devoted all my time and energy to uh, debate and to um, uh, baseball. And uh, that was uh, essentially what I did. I became... Um, involved in what I'd call politics. You know, I, I mentioned that speech that that president of that high school gave 
at your grade school. Yeah, at my grade school. And uh, I decided that I would run for president of the high school. And uh, we started a campaign and we used my dad's big flat truck that carried the cement around town. And the guys in the band would get on the back of that truck and we'd ride that truck up and down A Street uh, and toot the horns and everything. And uh, we were real campaigners and vote, vote for she, we vote for, vote for Hank. And uh, well, right the, the five days before the election, we played uh, Sheboygan North, our rival high school. And uh, I was pretty lucky that day. I pitched a two-hit shutout. And that was the talk of the high school that uh, she really shut out the rivals. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, I ended up winning the election by over 500 votes. So we had a high school of about 1,600, uh, which is significant in that um, my high school was bigger than the college that I went to uh, later. But I, I had a good debating career. Uh, Arnold Melzer was uh, the greatest high school teacher I had or er ever had. And uh, he was fifth in the nation in what's called NFL points, now, not National Football League points, but National Forensic League points points as a coach and he was known around the country as one of the finest debate coaches in the, in the nation and to have him uh, was pretty lucky. So my high school years were, were good. I, uh, I wanted to run for re-election. I, I had so much fun uh, being the president. We did a number of things like uh, uh, get the um, the armory in Sheboygan, which was built for the Sheboygan Redskins, a professional basketball team. Um, the Redskins were uh, good. It cost me 25 cents a game to sit on the stage and watch the pro games. Uh, Kenny Susans was one of the players, and he became the coach at Valparaiso University, where... Uh, Hummel Martin came from, the present, uh, uh, although Martin left and went to Notre Dame after a while, but uh, uh, Robbie uh, came out of that uh, Valparaiso environment, and uh, Wally Recolitis and Bob Kunzman went, uh, they were on that basketball team that I was part of for a while, and they went to Valparaiso and played uh, basketball there, but that uh, uh, one of the things I helped do is uh, work through my father, who was on the school board and was the president of the school board. I said, Dad, we want um, uh, baseball here in the high schools, and we want um, they had a suspended baseball because it's so cold up there in Wisconsin and uh, it isn't very, very call profitable. But uh, we got uh, the armory because our gym was so small. And we couldn't get everybody in the gym. And we uh, did, did a number of things. And I wanted to run for re-election. I thought I could win it real easy. Well, my debate partner, Conrad Gullick, uh, said, I'd like to be president. Here, you are you have already been president. Let me be president. He says, you give my nomination speech. And I'll win. And he says, you run for president of senior class. And, uh, well, that wasn't my idea. It was his idea. But I thought, he's a buddy. And I got to, uh, got to do this. Because, uh, well, the president of the senior class, all he does is essentially give the graduation address at the graduation. But in Sheboygan, that was a pretty big thing. Uh, public speaking was uh, a form of entertainment back in those days. You know, it's before television and sure. uh, inter in those entertainment type activities. And as many as uh, 10,000 people would come to Valworth Bowl because the two high schools, Sheboygan North and Sheboygan Central, would have their uh, graduations together. 
and there was a family function and every parent and every uh, kid, uh, regardless of age, would come and sit at Bow Bowl, which is only about I don't know, one block away from Lake Michigan. Beautiful place. And uh, I gave that speech there and Arnie Melzer helped me with it a little bit and uh, we gave a, a, a pretty good talk and it wasn't bad to be president of the senior class because I was able to organize the first reunion, high school reunion, even though I was down here at Purdue at that time. And uh, we got that going, I found out I could never do that again. Uh, but I would go to all the high school reunions and to see the, uh, my teammates, especially at the 25th reunion. Many of them had gone off to the Korean War. And I didn't because I was 4F. I had bad eyes. And uh, I had, uh, I think, another problem, a perforated eardrum or something like that. I don't know what it is that prevented me from being an Eagle Scout because I had a, I was a star a scout, I guess, because it's a rank under Eagle. And I never made it because I, could, I didn't want to, want to go underwater. And you can't swim if you don't <laughs> go in the water. You know? So uh, we, uh, uh, I still go to all the high school reunions. My wife, uh, who I'll talk about later when I met at college, uh, goes to all the reunions. And that, being that president of that class has uh, meant more to me, I think, than being president of the high school. Right. That's how this goes. So you carry Okay, on. let's talk a little bit. Now, you went to uh, Lake Forest. How did you happen to select to go there? All right, that's a good good question. Uh, because I didn't know, know whether I even wanted to go to college. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the, uh, when I was in um, second grade, um, my mother uh, asked one of the teachers uh, whether or not I was, uh, you know, college material. And the teacher said, oh, no, 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 don't plan on college for him. Well, this was, you know, a couple of years after I had trouble handling the mats in uh, kindergarten. So uh, I had to prove her wrong. You know. So anyhow, we, uh, uh, through debate with Arnie Mauser and through baseball and the high school team, I would travel basically around the state of Wisconsin and go to one school or college campus after another. As part of the debate team? Yeah, uh -huh. while I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I visited a n number of schools and uh, Lake Forest was really the prettiest one that I had ever seen. It, it was like a dream campus. It, Lake Forest is a beautiful community. And uh, of course, it's right on the lake, overlooks the lake. And it was the perfect picture of a, of a little liberal arts college. I didn't, didn't know it was that small, uh, but I, I went. I got a scholarship at the University of Wisconsin, a full tuition scholarship. I, I used to go down to the, the University of Wisconsin with some of my buddies because uh, I hope you're not offended by, by this, but they had free beer in the union at the University of Wisconsin. You That's could a drink, good deal. Oh. You, you could drink uh, whatever. Uh, whatever and, Was uh, that for everybody? Well, I, I don't know. Oh. I, I don't know how we, we pulled it off. Maybe, maybe we paid for it. I, I don't know. <laughs> was but it wasn't, mu wasn't much. It was diluted a little bit. It wasn't full force. But we'd go down there. And that, that was big time stuff when we were seniors. And, you know, sure. And we'd watch uh, Alan the Horse Amici practice and play football. He became a great football player. He played for Wisconsin? Wisconsin. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay. Alan the Horse Amici played for Wisconsin. And uh, we. Uh, went down there and we, we saw Wisconsin and I, I got this scholarship. Uh, I won't ask you to guess how much it was, but it was uh, $75 a semester. 
to go to the University of Wisconsin. And that was a pretty good good yeah. deal that um, compared to what Purdue is now. And uh, I, I uh, turned it down because I, th when I was at Lake Forest, I visited the coaches. And uh, John Breen was the baseball coach and the football coach. And Johnny Erickson, who later became the coach at the University of Wisconsin, was the basketball coach. And these coaches said, well, Hank, if you come to Lake Forest, we'll give you more money than uh, that $75 that you're getting from the University of Wisconsin. And we'll give you um, a grant and aid and we'll give you a little scholarship or something or other. Well, it added up to uh, more than the $75. We'll, we'll, we'll say that. I don't even know what, what I ended up with. But I worked for my uh, board four years in, in that uh, um, setup there. At, and I went to Lake Forest because you could play varsity ball the uh, uh, freshman year. If you went to Wisconsin, you had to sit out mm -hmm. the first year. That was the Big Ten rule. And uh, I wanted to play now. I didn't want to sit around and wait to play baseball. I wanted to play baseball right away. And uh, they had a good team. And as a matter of fact, last night, while I was starting to think of this interview you had, the center fielder of my college team called me and we talked about Archie Jones. Well, Archie Jones was the pitcher on the, on the team my freshman year and uh, Archie didn't give me much chance to pitch because he pitched one shot out after another and we won the college conference of, uh, of, of uh, Illinois and Archie Jones was signed by the St. Louis Browns, not the Cardinals, my favorite team, but the uh, St. Louis Browns. And we talked about that last night. But any of that, um, they had a lovely baseball diamond there, lovely facilities, and I uh, was sold that I could play right away. And that's, uh, I, I've told a lot of people that the reason I went to college was uh, to play baseball. Sure. And uh, uh, of course I was a debater and I joined the debate team too and I played four years of baseball and four years of, of debate. And debating really was more exhausting than uh, baseball. We'd go to, uh, we went to Purdue uh, for a debate tournament. That's where I saw Purdue for the very first time. And I was fairly impressed with Purdue. But uh, I didn't, never thought I'd be going to mm -hmm. Purdue University. But uh, I, I had a, a, a very nice college career and I became a speech major minored in history, was a, a fairly good student, not a straight A student, and I roomed with my catcher for two years in the fraternity house, and uh, the uh, uh, yeah. we talked baseball, we talked about the hitters and how to, how to face them and how to handle them, and the catcher went off into the service he was one year ahead of me in school. I hadn't, hadn't seen him in 50 years. And all of a sudden we found out that he's living in Wheaton, Illinois, which is uh, one, has one of the colleges that we played against. And uh, we got together 50 years later and uh, we, we now communicate with sure. one, one or another. Okay. But, uh, you can ask me some more questions about yeah, Lake, uh, Lake Forest. Yeah, talk or? a little bit about you know, when you came to Purdue then, and how'd that come up? They okay. have an old, you'd already gotten your PhD. Well, no, no, I, I oh. didn't get my PhD until I got... Oh, afterwards. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got to finish this college up here at Lake Forest. We had a lot of things happen there. Um, well, you know, I was kind of a, you know, a little politician interested in, in politics. And um, the voice put me up for a president of the fraternity. And uh, my 
won that, became president of the, of the fraternity. And um, I had to um, uh, set up the uh, social schedule for the year, my senior year. And uh, it reminds me of an incident at college. Uh, we had, you know, we had so many parties. Uh, who's going to work on the homecoming committee and direct um, this, this and that. And, uh, and it was so involved that I was taking this education course, a five-hour course in speech education. And I flunked the first test. Uh, I, I know I flunked kindergarten, but I didn't, don't remember ever flunking any other test. I must have flunked the accounting test because I had an A going into accounting my freshman year and I ended up with a C in the course. I, I figured I flunked that test and I never pursued it in terms of whether it was an F or not. But I had it two and two together and I figured out it was an F. So this was probably the second test that I flunked. Uh, so I said, now listen, I'm, you know, uh, I was in the, in the National Honor Society in high school. I was president of that too, incidentally. And uh, the, the um, uh, I, I told the prof, come on now, prof. I'm won a debate tournament here out in Virginia and finished second in the nation for Lake Forest College. I'm, you know that I'm not an F student. Let's make a deal. I said, if I get A's, on the remaining four tests that you got, will you give me an A in the course? He says, yeah, if you, you think you can get an A on the next four tests, I'll give you an A. Well, I got an A on four tests and ended up with a B in the course. So I said, now what is this? We, I thought we had a deal. And he said, well, once we added all the total points together, you didn't come up with the, with the A that you needed for the course. I said, all right, forget it. <laughs> But my debate partner at uh, Lake Forest, I had two of them. One of them was Eddie Walker. He ended up finishing first in this law class at the University of Michigan. He was one of the brightest kids that I ever met. He was in my fraternity. We were fraternity brothers. And Eddie had all straight A's. I never had all, all A's because I worked in a dining hall. I worked on a ball diamond. I worked on a debate team. And um, then in my senior year, I started chasing a girl. But anyhow, the, these things kind of interfere with the guy's uh, uh, pursuit of a straight A average, you know. So I, I wasn't doing uh, too well. But Eddie had all these A's, and uh, he got one B. And he went to his teacher at Lake Forest and said, is there any extracurricular work or anything I can do to get that um be changed at A so that I'm applying to law school and I want to get into the law school at the University of Michigan. And they said, no, no, no. Uh, he says, please change that, that B so that I got a clean record. So the teacher said, uh, and I forget which teacher it was at Lake Forest, he says, I'll change it for you. So Eddie got his grade back. The teacher gave him a C for the course. But Eddie went on and finished first in this law class, and then that uh, was uh, fine, and uh, I'm sure he's lived a reasonably happy life ever ever after. Well, the, the big event in my life at college was running into one of my fraternity brother's sister. This was um, Jessamine Bridell, <coughs> and uh, we had an incident in, at the college, and I've told this to the family many times, and if they ever hear this tape, they're going to say, oh, there goes Hank again, talking about the Kappa Sigma crisis, but they're going to have, this should be in the records. I got a card from the dean at Lake Forest College at Christmas time that said, when you come back, Hank Sheely, you come into my office for disciplinary action. And I thought, what in the world is that about? 
and that's on a postcard. Here, my dad is the president of the school board, and all this public stuff. I don't know. I guess it was the mailman didn't care about it, but it was a kind of an, a card of alarm that I that I'm in trouble in college. Well, I said, "What's what's up, Dean Hugesteger?" And he says, "Well, your fraternity has violated the campus drinking laws." And I said, "What do you mean?" We didn't violate any campus drinking laws. He said, well, when you led those Kappa Six to the sorority row and sang Christmas carols and woke everybody up on the night before you went home for the end of the first semester, you created a havoc and uh, we went and uh, checked out the Capacig house and there was the smell of beer in the house. And uh, I said, well, we were all drinking up at the Green Lantern. And, we, you know, when you're seniors and whatnot, you're going to have a bottle of beer. And uh, I guess some of us even had two of them. But anyhow, uh, we, uh, uh, I said, we had to have a meeting. I said, guys, I thought we were all up together as a unit, up at the Green Lantern. Did anybody stay back and drink or do anything in the, in the house? And I said, no, no, no. And uh, they said, well, the, the football coach has reported to the dean that uh, we uh, had done some drinking because the campus cigars smelled like a brewery. Well, I said, oh, hell, uh, let's check this out <coughs> and uh, I carefully interviewed everybody and I couldn't find one guy to admit that he had had a beer in the fraternity house so I said I got to talk to the president President Johnson and here's a Purdue link President Johnson's son was a professor in the management school over here at Purdue where I'm going to end up pretty soon and anyhow, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm going to end up at Purdue, not in the management school. My daughter's going to be in the management school, and my son-in-law, and my granddaughter. But anyhow, the um, uh, he said, now what uh, what can I do? Um, this the uh, dean is wrong. We, we we are not guilty of this charge. We were fined seventy-five dollars, which was big time money at that, at that time, pretty big time, and put on social probation for the whole semester. He says, "Well, I'm not, I am not going to overrule my dean. This is the president of Johnson of Lake Forest College." He said, "I can't overrule the dean, but I, I said, why don't you get together with the dean, and uh, if you guys can come up with three agreeable." members to sit on the board of arbitration, I will accept the decision of that board of arbitration. And uh, we'll let them decide whether you're innocent or guilty. Okay. <coughs> well, we were told to uh, get one businessman from the community, and I got a guy named Al Bridal. And he was the father of one of my fraternity brothers who had left the college and uh, gone into business with uh, his father. And then we got the music professor because we knew the music professor was not a teetotaler. We wanted to make sure that we had somebody that was sympathetic with our position. And then we got one other guy, I guess a history professor, and uh, we, we knew he was a square, fair-minded man and would have the ability to listen to the arguments and make an intelligent decision. Well, the president of the college wanted me to make the case for guilty or innocent, you know, and I said, well, we're innocent. I said, and uh, yeah. I said, so what is the evidence that you have against my fraternity house? He said, well, we caught, I saw one empty bottle of beer in the hallway that was spilled over and beer was all over the floor. And I said, well, that must have contributed to the uh, uh, to the problem. 
but I said some five elk could have thrown that in the front door. It was within 10 feet of the door. I said, you did your scout who was snooping around looking at the cabins and else see anybody do it? Do you have a witness? No, no. Well, anyhow, I used my debate training. And I made a case, and the Board of Arbitration voted three to nothing in favor of the fraternity. We won that case, and they had to drop the fine, and we continued <coughs> having a good social <coughs> social semester. But there was a gal that was um, related, well, it was the daughter of Mr. Bridehell, uh, who was a fairly uh, uh, success, successful businessman. He was the uh, he was a, got his law degree during the Depression, went into business with his father-in-law, in the business forms business, and then eventually the carbon paper business. Remember these business forms that had seven or eight sheets, and you throw the carbon paper out? Well, that eventually kind of went by the wayside uh, in terms of the technology we have today. But anyhow, uh, he, he, he was a real great man, and... Uh, as a matter of fact, he uh, went to Washington, D.C. one time, came out of the, uh, to see the uh, Supreme Court, and uh, De Dean Rutledge came out and said to him, he was one of the Supreme Court justices at the time, and he says, Al Bridell, what you doing here? And Al was, uh, um, he was, um, uh, his former student at Washington University in uh, St. Louis, and he remembered him from years later. So uh, he he was he had made made his uh, mark and made his uh, people take attention, you know. And he was an impressive member of the board. And I was uh, starting to date his daughter in, inadvertently. I was trying to tell. Uh, the daughter, what was going on with this case and why I couldn't spend more time with her and everything. And uh, she went along with it. And, uh, uh, well, we won the case. We, d we won some debates. We won some baseball games. And it was time to uh, go to graduate school. And I'm going to swing, uh, you want me to swing into Purdue. Mm -hmm. Here we go. And uh, uh, my debate co coach was Robert Martin at uh, Lake Forest. He was a Northwestern PhD. He uh, was a great uh, man. I was blessed to have two great debate coaches, one in high school, one in college. And we traveled virtually all over the country. I guess that... Uh, tournament where we finished second in the nation was his biggest achievement and probably maybe one of mine and Ron Hagmeyer who is my debate partner he was a fraternity brother of mine also All, a lot of my buddies were either on the baseball team or the debate team and uh, we had quite a house together but anyhow Jess came on the scene she was introduced to me by um, Bob Bridell's uh, wife, who had been the homecoming queen, she um, was a great athlete. She would kick, kick the footballs all over the f field at uh, Lake Forest, and there weren't many women that did that. And uh, I know that when she was a freshman, they they would not um, uh, give her a bid to any of the sororities. It was uh, perceived as being a little unladylike kicking footballs with the boys. She won the homecoming queen contest and every sorority on the campus gave her a bid. And uh, she told them to uh, get lost. But anyhow, uh, Jess uh, uh, was introduced to me, you know, by uh, Audrey Bridell, uh, Bridell and Bob Bridell. And uh, Jess was going with another 
Yeah, the, the dean of uh, the School of Speech at Northwestern, McBurney, he was the um, one of the outstanding speechmen in America. And his daughter was going to the Lake Forest. His daughter was Jess's roommate. Jess is going to end up being my wife in this story here. And anyhow, uh, uh, this McBurney gal got kind of sick and, and uh, she dropped out after about a couple weeks of school and Jess had the room all by herself. And she was going with another boy at another college and she was kind of lonely. All she did was study. Well, she had uh, won a Pat Floyd Award at Island Park High School where I did my practice teaching. And that was an award given for character and uh, scholarship and citizenship. And she was an outstanding girl. I did that my practice teaching there. I was starting to date her and I asked the people about her and she said, oh, she's an outstanding girl. So I thought it was worth getting to know her a little better. And um, I uh, would start walking her home nights because she's a slow eater. And uh, she's one of the last gals we had to kind of clean up and get out of the cafeteria where I was working. And uh, I felt that it was getting dark at night, so it was my duty to walk her home. And after many walks, we decided to date once or twice, even though she was dating another guy. And I was surprised that she accepted. And on this, it's not love at first sight, but on the uh, second date that we had, uh, I fell in love with her. I said, this is the girl I'm gonna marry. And I did. What the? Uh, That's okay. We can stop for a second. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, well, Jess um, was a wonderful, wonderful gal, and uh, I, um, I didn't know what I was going to do when I graduated from college. Sure. And Bob Martin said, "Why don't you try for this?" teaching assistantship at Lake Forest College. I, I mean, a teaching assistantship at Purdue. Uh -huh. And when you could leave Lake Forest College, you could go there and uh, teach uh, uh, speech and perhaps help coach debate. So I got this beautiful letter from uh, Alan H. Monroe after I applied for a uh, uh, scholarship or a teaching assistantship. And we were using Monroe's textbook in, in our speech class. Uh, it was about the sixth or seventh edition. Let's see, where are those? Okay, here are Monroe books right above my desk. Now I know I can't hear them, but there's 17 editions of that book and it's still in publication. And I'll talk about Monroe later. But anyhow, when I got that teaching assistantship, I said, Jess, it looks I'm, like I'm headed to Purdue. Will you come with me? And she said, yes, I will. So there was uh, tantamount to uh, uh, engagement. We, of course, had an engagement um, uh, later. And we uh, got married in August. This was a pretty quick romance from about January to August. And uh, she was a freshman. She was voted the outstanding freshman in at Lake Forest College mm -hmm. because she studied all the time. The other gals didn't study as much as she did. But um, I didn't hold that against her. So we um, uh, decided to get married and we went on our honeymoon. And we came from our honeymoon direct to the Raw State Apartments, located directly behind the uh, press box of the football stadium. And that was our first home. And about the time that we moved in as a married couple, I think it was the next day that another married couple 
payment. I drove down in my little old Ford that I bought for $600 so that I could go to uh, Highland Park High School five miles away from Lake Forest to do my practice teaching. But the other guy that came, came in a big limousine, big black limousine came out and uh, he looked uh, well, pr pretty impressive. And um, he was. His name was George Steinbrenner. So George and Joni Steinbrenner, George became the owner of the New York Yankees. Well, George um, lived next door to us, and he, he was the perfect one to to fit because every, everybody else in a married student apartment was either an engineer or an ag student. Uh, I knew how to pull weeds in Sheboygan, but I didn't know how to plant anything successfully. So I didn't know much about agriculture. <coughs> and uh, uh, I didn't know much about engineering, although my grandson right there just graduated one year ago from the Purdue School of Engineering and is now in Paris within a year working on uh, projects for uh, a firm that uh, uh, is quite active. But um, anyhow, um, Georgia and I would be able to talk sports. You know, you come to a big university like this, there was 13,000 at the time. Uh, I didn't know much about engineering, didn't know much about agriculture, I didn't know about the liberal arts and, and speech. But uh, we talked a lot about sports and he told me what what goes on in Notre Dame in terms of their recruiting. And I don't want to say anything uh, uh, disrespectful about Notre Dame. Uh, but um, he told me about uh, Emil Red Sitko, one of the running backs at Notre Dame. And after he would play a ball game, the alums would give him a $100 bill for every touchdown he made. I said, gee, that, that, that's something. And he had one story after another like that, and we, we, we talked, and he, he knew the inside of uh, athletics pretty well, and uh, we developed a friendship, and we exchanged Christmas cards with Joni and George for about 15 years until, and this uh, jumps way ahead of my graduate career and, and whatnot, but I became a baseball coach in West Lafayette. And I had a little league team that was 19 and all. They won all the games. And George, George had just bought the Yankees, and his team wasn't doing too well. It was a start, and uh, he won more championships, I think, than any owner in the history of baseball. But anyhow, uh, I challenged George's New York Yankees with my little league team. And uh, I never got a response or a letter. And I never got another Christmas card. And George was not the type to uh, accept an invitation to play a little league team <laughs> when he owned the New York Yankees. So that uh, <laughs> didn't work out. No. And that uh, relationship is over. And poor George just uh, passed away, I think, a year or two ago. Uh, within the last year. Yeah, within the, within the last year. This year, I believe, yeah. Yeah, but he, he was a great guy, and he coached football for one year. He helped a lot with the recruiting. And his dad told him, uh, you know, you've done this. Uh, he may have done that on a volunteer basis. I don't even know whether he was on a, uh, on a salary basis. But of course, he didn't need a salary. And uh, But he coached for the fun of it. And his dad finally said, now, George, you got to grow up, and you got to take my, these five ore boats that I got on the Great Lakes. And you had to run the shipping business, and it was that shipping business that allowed him to generate the ten million plus dollars to buy the Yankees from CBS, and now those uh, Yankees are worth billions, and that's how that dollar keeps changing from the ten cents a movie, two movies for a dime, to the prices that we have today. Okay, we're ready to talk about uh, Purdue now. Yeah. Well, this, I'm going to stop for a second. Okay, go ahead. 
<coughs> well, well, we're at um, at Purdue, and um, I got your see, assistantship. Yeah, I got my teaching assistantship, and um, it took me two years to uh, get the master's degree because mm-hmm. you're uh, really in that position. You're a half-time teacher and a half-time student, so it takes two years to get the uh, master's. Mm-hmm. So I got the um, master's in um, communication. I worked with uh, Monroe, Owen Stallard, Lee Winch, Ross Smith, Gene Kildall, Earl Harlan, and all kinds of uh, guys that came in and moved out of here. Mason Hicks was one of one guy. And I uh, took a number of the courses. I took uh, courses with uh, Bob Ringel, who was a young um, student who eventually became the dean of the uh, liberal arts school. Mm -hmm. Uh, Phil Tompkins eventually became a dean of the uh, liberal arts school and assistant or associate dean. Uh, One of the fellows, I just read about him the other, well, he's in the latest... uh, Oh, an, annual, alumni annual or something. Uh, Danny Angel, he uh, he wrote a uh, uh, book on uh, George, George Romney. Oh, uh-huh. uh, Daniel Angel. And he has been the uh, yeah, president of five five different colleges. So, I mean, I, I had a lot of people here that uh, I either met uh, in graduate school or not that uh, one number of, actually some of my students have become, um, you know, deans, um, department chairman, head, heads of departments, and so forth. So I had a number of interesting uh, students. The early years, a lot of the uh, graduate students used the speech degree for the ministry. They wanted to be a doctor of uh, uh, and work towards a Ph.D. I, I asked Monroe uh, after I taught the, uh, two years and uh, got the master's, I said, what do you have to do to become uh, a college professor? And he says, well, you need your union card. And I said, well, what's that? He says, that's a Ph.D. So... Monroe was the president of the National Speech Association. He was the, probably one of the finest uh, speech teachers I've had. I got to add him in with uh, Melzer and Martin, and Monroe may have more of the national reputation than any of those. First two that, that got me started. But uh, after I got the master's degree, I said, okay, I got I got to get a PhD, but I can't afford it. I'm just about broke. Uh, my wife came down here from, uh, from uh, her freshman year and started her sophomore year. And uh, she graduated in uh, uh, Mrs. Ford's class of uh, 59, 59. I got the master's in 58. So Monroe said, well, why don't you be an instructor for a couple of years? and earn some money, and then go get that PhD later. So, well, I, while I was here being an instructor, I became the uh, assistant director of uh, forensics. I became the uh, director of novice debate. Uh, I did a number of things with the basic course. And uh, then finally... I, while I was an instructor, I could take a course or two each, each sure. semester, and uh, I was here at the summertime, and I took the courses, started building up credits for a Ph.D., and I think in uh, 1960, uh, uh, let's see, when did I get that degree? 1962. Yeah, I got the Ph.D. in 1962, and um, became... Um, an assistant prof then. So the graduate years were interesting. Uh, I again, uh, you, you see the the, uh, the the politics in me. 
we started, uh, Herb Simons and I started what was called the Graduates Student uh, Society. We were really called the non sequiturs. Uh, that means we don't necessarily follow. And we felt the graduate students should be kind of organized informally, not in a union sense, but in a sense of that we get to express our interests and uh, put a little pressure on the faculty once in a while. And we um, started, and one of the functions was to invite a faculty member to a home or an apartment and uh, have him tell us about his courses and what he teaches and so forth, and that's fine. So I became the first uh, president of the Graduate Student Association, which is still functioning uh, today. So at almost every level, and I think that's the last time I became president of anything, because I got sick and tired of it. <laughs> I thought, uh, I'll, I'll go in other directions in the, in the, in the, in the future. <clears throat> so uh, we, we really did study so darn much that uh, uh, the only f fun that we had uh, other than the joy of scholarship and the joy of uh, writing and, and uh, the academics and learning about the field of communication in a theoretical as well as a practical way it uh, uh, was again we'd, we'd have a uh, a few outdoor parties and we had a softball team and we had a lot of fun with the um, softball team we had one of the best ones on campus and I remember that we would play the uh, athletic department well the athletic department had guys like uh, George King Bob King uh, and it, they were just loaded with all, everybody in the athletic department was athletic. And we were all a bunch of, uh, oh, supposedly uh, academic uh, intellectuals, which I prove, <coughs> I've proven by this uh, interview that I'm not necessarily a pure in intellectual. But uh, uh, we, we, we took them on and we beat them. And uh, we, we had a pitcher that, uh, you know, if you have one good softball pitcher that can pitch real, real well, I, I, I did not pitch softball. I pitched overhand uh, hardball, and uh, they didn't they didn't play that at, at, at our age or level here. But uh, uh, we we did have fun doing those things, and it kept the spirit of the department going. And we had uh, maybe close to a hundred members in the communication department in the early um, 50s or, or it's the late late 50s 56 is when I came 58 got the masters 62 got the PhD and then became the assistant okay. professor you want to cut it here I think that's a good point yes <coughs> um.